Penny Byrne, who's a visual artist and conservator. Um, I won't go on too much because I don't want to steal her thunder. <laughs> but um, Penny, Penny's work, um, in her work she uses materials such as vintage porcelain figurines and found objects including to children's toys to create artworks that wield a powerful political message. Penny's often hum humorous and satirical viewpoint presents an ongoing inquiry into popular culture and international politics. Her training as a specialist as a ceramics conservator informs her practice. And Penny currently has a, a large work in the um, exhibition Melbourne now at the NGV. So I'll introduce Penny to talk to us about her work. Thank you. Thanks, Ali. Um, well, it's been great to, to be invited to, to speak here tonight, and I'm really pleased to see so many people here. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's excellent. So let me just jump right in. Um, I thought I'd start with restore. So I've jumbled, jumbled the words around. I think it's... What, what is it? What is it? Renew, restore. Renew, restore, respect is tonight. Well, I'm going to be um, starting with restore, then renew, and then respect. So anyway... Um, it sort of fits in with my practice and it gets me, gives me a chance to sort of explain to you uh, where I'm coming from. So I'll start with Restore. I work as a specialist ceramics conservator. It's been my profession for about 20 years, I suppose. And so what I thought I'd do is I'd show you some slides of some of the pieces I've restored. Uh, that will give you a sense of the sorts of skills that I've got as a ceramics restorer. And then my artwork has come directly from my ceramics restoration work. So let me start with this slide. This belongs to the University of Melbourne Classics Collection. I did a big job for them a few years ago. I think I restored about 40 of their um, ancient Greek and Cypriot ceramics. So you can see uh, she's, she's an earthenware, I don't know how many potters there are in the group, I know there's one up the back. Um, she's an earthenware um, Cypriot ceramic figure. And there she is all back together Oh, there we go. Uh, there she is all back together. I guess I want to also talk about conservation and restoration as well, and I don't know if you know the difference between those two concepts. When I'm working for, on, a, on a very ancient, very precious piece like this um, for Melbourne Uni, it's, I'm doing conservation, so I'm literally just sticking it back together uh, with special adhesive that won't go yellow and, um, and maybe filling some of the missing areas with, with a sort of a, a, a filler that's a similar colour, but I'm not trying to repair it uh, or restore it in any way. So this piece has been conserved. This piece, on the other hand, is a um, Derby shepherdess figure, and she belonged to an antique dealer, and he wanted it fully restored. So she was missing her sheep, and she was also <laughs> missing... Um, leaves and her arm was off and um, she'd been repaired with old sticky horrible shellac adhesive and so my job was to actually recreate um, well all the missing areas but particularly a new sheep so that that involved quite a bit of research to come up with what the sheep would have looked like I had to look in books and find a picture of it and um, then I modeled the sheep in, in um, just in plasticine and then I took a mould of it and then I cast it in dental, dental plaster, which is a bit harder than normal plaster of Paris, and uh, then painted it with the conservation um, mat materials that we use and tinted it, the, the, the paint to be the right colour to match the, sh the sheep. So, uh, so there she is all, all back together. I also had to make all the little missing leaves and petals uh, as well, and I made them out of an epoxy putty that I made myself. So epoxy resin, you might be familiar with araldite, something like that, but this is, again, a museum standard um, epoxy. Um, I would have added um, French chalk, which is an inert powder, to make the putty, and then you can actually model with it, and um, then you sand it back and you can create these uh, amazing results. So that's, that's, that was certainly a challenge, getting the sheep right. And she's quite, the sheep's quite small in, in sort of relation to her, but that was what it was like in the pictures that I found, so that was the new sheep. This is another Melbourne University piece. This one is a Cypriot, um, low-fired Cypriot piece. And interestingly, this one I actually did restore. You can see that the, it's been stuck back together and then you've got the fills and then the other side is where I've actually painted all the filled areas 
to match the original. And that was because at Melbourne Uni there were different professors who were involved in this project. And one of the professors liked conservation <laughs> and the other professor liked restoration. So I just kind of did what, what he, you know, whoever, you know, what they wanted. So in this case he wanted it pretty much restored so that all of the fills were painted to the right colour. And in this case I just used acrylic paint to do the in-painting. So that was just another one of my materials that I use. This piece is a Saxon um, wine jug and it belonged to an antique dealer. He wanted it fully restored. It was stuck together with uh, concrete. <laughs> so that's actually just a real nightmare to get off. It's not really soluble in anything. Well, it might be soluble in some acids, but it would also dissolve the, the ceramic. So I actually had to get rid of it using a dental drill. And to be honest, I actually probably did damage the pot in the process of taking off the concrete. but. Really, it was, it was so unsightly, it had to be done. So that's me with my dental drill, just drilling away and trying to only drill the concrete, but not the, but not the pot. The pot's a low-fired earthenware, so quite a soft ceramic body. Um, it, was, it was very, very time-consuming and difficult. But you can see the sort of skills I need. I've got to be very focused and very patient, and, um, but also very respectful to the objects as well. And that's it, uh, fully restored. So you can see um, that was absolute full-on restoration. Uh, again, just with acrylic paints, um, but colour matching to match the original ceramic glaze and finish as accurately as possible. So from a distance, you really can't tell that this piece has been restored. Um, I can always tell my restorations. I, I, you get so familiar with objects that you're actually you know, I, I can just look at something and know that I've restored it. But, but to the untrained eye, sometimes these pieces maybe, um, you know, people can't tell. Uh, and that's an interesting dilemma, I think. You know, he's an antique dealer. He's then just maybe, I don't know, what. once the piece leaves my studio, I can't speak for it anymore. So I think it's just that buyer beware thing. If you're ever buying an antique, have a really good look at it because someone like me could have had a go at it. You, know. <laughs> you never really know what's going on. This is Romeo and Juliet, <laughs> so Romeo needed a new head. <laughs> Similar process to the sheep, so I modelled one up and I made, I made the new head for Romeo. It's looking much happier. I'll zip through because I've got a lot of slides. This uh, belongs to Melbourne Cricket Club, a uh, little cricket guy. He was um, stuck with really old araldite. Um, the process for him was literally conservation. They, they just wanted um, everything conserved, just stuck back together with special non-yellowing adhesive. And I don't only do ceramics, more broadly I'm known as an objects conservator. So that means that um, if it, in conservation you have special areas for conservators, they'd be paper conservators, paintings conservators, and then more broadly objects conservators, textiles conservators, that sort of thing. And within objects you can then specialise in metals or in my case ceramics or, or um, organic objects like wood and that sort of thing. But this is an emu egg so it cla it's classed as an organic object but it's still an object and I treated it much the same as a smash pot so uh, that's it back together with some areas filled in. And that's it finished. So that was one that was um, again a, a conservation, a restoration job. So fully restored. So that gives you a sense of my skills as as a conservator, um, which brings me to renew. Um, and I and I'm going to show you the very first artwork I made. And then, but I have to explain why I made it because it's quite bizarre. So it's called "It's Murder on the Dance Floor." Um, it's a ballerina. She's beheaded another ballerina and uh, she's pretty happy about it as you can see. Um, it's the Sophie Ellis Baxter song, It's Murder on the Dance Floor. So um, my studio is in Easy Street in Collingwood and back in the 70s some women were murdered, a few people are nodding um, and it became a bit of an urban myth because they didn't ever solve these really brutal murders and so it, whenever I say my studio is in Easy Street if people know about it like you clearly do, they go, ooh, Easy Street, you know, Easy Street murders. So um, back in 2005, um, the people running my, my studio decided to have a Melbourne Fringe Festival show and they called it Murder on Easy Street. So that was the theme of the exhibition. And I was happily working as a conservator at this space 
and thought, oh, I could put something in this show. And um, so I thought, I've got these old ballerinas that are all smashed, and maybe I'll make an artwork out of that. And so that's why the murder theme. So I'm not necessarily a sort of a gruesome, macabre person. It was kind of prompted by this murder theme. So um, I had a lot of fun with that, and um, like a lot of fringe festival shows, not many people saw it. Um, <laughs> but the people who did see it thought it was good. Uh, and, then, and then I was sitting on a tram and I saw a, an ad for Linden postcard show. So I don't know how many people know about Linden, but that's an open entry postcard show. Anyone can enter, small scale artwork. And the sign said, thousands of people will see your work. And I thought, that's cool, because you know, I think it's funny and I'd like other people to see it too. Because um, I really wasn't searching to be an artist at this point. And um, so as a result of putting it in the Linden Postcard Show, it won a prize, it won one of the postcard prizes. And um, from the strength of that, I got picked up by a commercial gallery and the rest, the, the, it's been a crazy sort of six or seven years since then. So that's how I've become an artist. But you can see that I'm using my skills as a conservator. I'm still working in ceramics. And um, from there, I, I've started to... It sort of brings together all my ideas about the world, about politics, about the environment, about social justice. And I'm using the figurines to actually... That's a close-up. It's pretty cool, isn't it? <laughs> I really freaked myself out when I did that. It just looked so real. It's just... Because that's just the porcelain, you know. That's just... Uh, there she is. She's looking right at me. <laughs> She's delighting. And I made her sort of keel build, so she's wearing the keel build outfit, you know, the yellow jumpsuit. Um, I actually remember getting the, the guy next to me in the studio. When I did it, I, I, I said, oh, I just don't know about this. Come and have a look. It's so gross. And he laughed. And I, I thought, all right, that's good. I'll, I'm happy to put it out there. But I really, I'm, I've got really good with blood now. And I put blood on a lot of things. <laughs> but back then, I really wasn't up for blood. So, uh, so jumping right forward now, I'll, I've got a pictures of some other artworks as well. I'll show you too. But... This is my most recent work that, this was shown at Linden um, in 2012, but this is now bigger than that and it's at, in Melbourne now um, at Federation Square. And it's, it's called I Protest and it's a mass of figurines. It came about after the Arab Spring and I saw all these people protesting in Tahrir Square and in Tunisia. And I wanted to create an artwork that was actually, looked like a protest and looked like masses of people. And I thought, well, maybe I can put all these figurines on the wall and, um, that would be a way to... Usually figurines are presented on, on plinths, but, but I couldn't get that massive protest kind of feeling that you see when you see pictures of thousands of people. <coughs> um, my other dilemma uh, was, and this is where the renew comes in, was um, how do I get all these figurines? I needed hundreds. And so what I did was I put a call out on my Facebook page and said, do you want to be part of this project? If you do, if, you know, donate a figurine, I usually pay about two or three dollars, they're from op shops. So people sort of were rescuing their figurines from the op shops and sending them to me. It was kind of like Christmas for about six months, you know, I just kept getting these. these. And I got over 150 donated, which was really great. And um, that meant that I could actually make this work happen. So that was, that was the picture I put on Facebook. This is what I use. These are all these cheap figurines. You just get them in, you know, all the op shops and... Um, and then they started coming in. So as they came in, I actually took photos of them like that, just on my phone. I'd repost them on my Facebook page. And, and because people were posting them, you have to write your name and address. So I would be able to know who sent them. So I'd be able to say, thank you, Jill, for these lovely pieces. And, and then also I had their address. So I sent them a postcard um, you know, from me back to them saying, thank you for being part of this project. So it's kind of like my little unfunded possible campaign, you know, I, I wasn't asking for money, but I was asking for figurines. And then there, there's a mass of them in my studio. So what I did was I, I painted all their faces with the national flags of protests that have happened over the last two years. So I started tracking all the protests that were happening in the world. And there was almost one a week at, at one point, you know, they were, there was in Ecuador and Nepal and Malaysia and and uh, Nigeria and Russia and, and I just kept tracking all these protests and as they happened I would actually make some of these figurines um, from particular countries and I saw them as souvenirs of the protests. So I wrote Russia around the base or Tunisia or 
or to rear square. Um, so there, it's as though you're finding a souvenir from a protest you've been to. It's kind of referencing the history of ceramics um, making where you might get a little souvenir from Brighton Beach or something. So I'm imagining if you went to this protest, how could you get, how could you get um, a souvenir? Even that little tiny one, that's, she's this, this big, she even got donated, I just think she's really cute. So she's ended up being from Malaysia and she's now in the exhibition. So if you do go, try and find the tiny little Malaysian lady. This is them all set up at Linden ready to be installed. I literally just stuck hooks on their backs and then I just hammer a nail in the wall and um, stick, them on, stick them on the wall. So there's no kind of... Um, plan. It's, I just want it to be a mass of figurines, so I just kept putting nails in and just keep putting figurines up. So that was the Linden installation. I had one of, I uh, just had the big dining room at Linden, if, if any of you know Linden, and um, there were sort of other elements. The, the, the figurines on the uh, plinth were Occupy Wall Street figurines, and I chose all the figurines that were sit sitting down to be Occupy Wall Street because they they all sat in Occupy Wall Street. They didn't march around, so that's just another view of it. So that's sort of a better shot. You can actually see their faces. A lot of the, particularly in um, the Arab Spring in, in um, the Tahrir Square protests, a lot of people were painting their face in the Egyptian flag. So I started to do that as well. We've got Spain there for the. Um, anti-austerity riots and that's some Occupy Wall Street people so they had 99% written on their face and I saw that a lot with some of the protesters too because they were saying that 1% had all the money and 99% didn't and that was what the Occupy movement was about. And this was um, a little small section that was Syria and in 2012 it was pretty bad well now it's even worse so um, all the figurines that got sent to me, sometimes people didn't really know how to pack them all that well and they got broken in the mail. If they were broken, that was okay, I just made them from Syria. So, um, it's not really okay, but yeah. So, I just stuck them back in correctly. So, that woman's head in the middle was off. So, she's now holding her head. And so, you can see my aversion to blood has completely dissipated. <laughs> Some of them are, you know, tipping on a side. Some are holding their own arm. I mean, it's gross, and it's up. It's, but it's, it's. I'm making a point, I suppose, about about what's going on. I actually had fun making the dribbles out of epoxy resin on that one. So, yeah. So you can get quite a moving artwork out of a cute little figurine. So they're almost standalone artworks as well, but you know they're now they're they're part of the many hundred. They're over three hundred and twenty in the show. Occupy Wall Street. Russian work, Russian. Yeah. That's my favourite. That's a little um, I protest uh, artist because in Russia all it was at the time there were a lot of artists and cultural you know people interested in culture were being um, censored. London riots. And this figurine looked like Frida Kahlo, so I just made her into Frida, Frida Kahlo. She wasn't, a, you know, she's not a protester necessarily, but I just, so she's in there too, just for fun. And the riot police, so all the clowns I got became riot police. So, uh, yeah, yeah. I've only got two minutes, so I don't have time to get, really, I don't think, to my, uh, oh, and Ai Weiwei, Ai Weiwei, who's, uh, yes, we all know Ai Weiwei, the Chinese dissident. So there, he's the only one who's named in this work, because he's actually one of the few people that, really in his own country doesn't have a voice so um, and I put some other works in here as well but I really I think I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to just maybe talk about this one and then and then end um, my, when I my respect part was going to be about um, my work uh, when I do large-scale conservation projects like um, I've just finished at Monash University um, the big um, stained glass window at Robert Blackwood Hall. I don't know if any of you know that, but it was by Leonard French. And um, when I'm working as a conservator, there's a great deal of respect that I have when I'm working on artworks. And even if it's a massive window, I still treat it with the same amount of respect as I do uh, a, a little artwork in my studio. But I'll finish off with this one. This is called The Four Horsemen of the 21st Century Apocalypse. So I was imagining... I was thinking about the book of Revelation and, and the end of the world and 
the four horsemen were, you know, pestilence and famine and death. And, and I was thinking, well, what are the four big issues that are facing humanity uh, in the 21st century? And I'm thinking that it's uh, food insecurity, water scarcity, um, peak oil and overpopulation. So, and then, of course, climate change sits right above all of that. So these are four horses really talking about that horseman riding into judges. That's food. So I literally got food. I got, I got corn and rice and dried beans and, start, and literally stuck it all on with, with PVA. And it was a great idea at the time, but man, did that take a long time. You know, that's my <laughs> conservative skills kicking in. So I had to be so patient. You know, I was following the patterns on the horse. Um, it was a lot of fun, but yeah. That's peak oil. So in that case, I went to my hardware shop and just bought all these really random kind of war type sort of pointy bits of silver and stuff. And then I just poured um, black paint uh, with a kind of a um, iridescent powder pigment in it so that it looked really oily. It's quite a lot of fun. And I, I like to use the action man. I'm, I'm using a lot of toys in my work now as well and, and just kind of mixing things up. And overpopulation. Um, just heaps and heaps of people. I got all these people on eBay. They were just some strange kind of train set people. But I just wanted, I, you know, those those pictures you see of you know trucks in Pakistan where they're just thousands of people, hundreds, are packed on on this truck, or they're all packed on a train. I wanted to have that that, that sort of look. There's heaps of people. And water. Uh, I actually found a smashed windscreen in Easy Street because someone had broken into someone's car and I got my little dustpan and brush and went out and swept up this smashed glass. So it's actually mini smashed glass mosaic all over the horse to make it look kind of like water and I just used sponges and all that other sort of bits of water. I got a tap uh, and a, my, my hardware guy really, he knows what I do now but at the time he really didn't know what I was doing and uh, he would shake his head, but now he's, he's, you know, he knows what I'm doing and he supports me. So I think I'll leave it there, but um, thank you very much. <laughs>